Chat with Traders, episode 58. The biggest secret of the best traders in the world is that they're just like everyone else. However, they've worked hard to learn the markets and discover what works and what doesn't. But how can you hear about these journeys and get in on the strategies and tactics they use? You can do it by listening to Chat with Traders. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. This week's episode of the Chat with Traders podcast is sponsored by the good folks at Trading Technologies. Get professional trading tools and superior execution with the world-class TT platform from Trading Technologies. Trade futures from virtually anywhere on any device, whether that's a multi-monitor workstation, laptop, or mobile phone. Visit trade.tt now and sign up for a free demo. Explore the TT platform from Trading Technologies and see if it's a good fit for you. Try it free today at trade.tt. Okay, what's up team? Thanks so much for joining me on episode 58. I'm your host, Aaron Firefield, and this week I spoke with Paul Singh. Paul is a longtime trader who has been doing this since his college days. Over the years, he's traded stocks, options, and futures, but now tends to focus purely on stocks. In fact, Paul actually began trading during the dot-com boom and quickly racked up huge profits. He was living large in a penthouse, his neighbors were professional athletes, and all was good until the bubble burst, and that's when he shortly after returned to square one. So during this interview, we discussed the light bulb moments and changes Paul made to his trading, which helped him to achieve sustainability and consistency. We talk about how he transitioned into full time trading why you should be cautious of micromanaging positions, and overall, how to be a better swing trader. It's worth mentioning there's also something within this interview for day traders because Paul is very active on an intraday time frame too. Now, Paul is also offered to answer any questions you may have. So while you're listening, if there's something you'd like more info on or perhaps something doesn't quite make sense, go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash 58 and leave a question you want answered at the bottom of the page. All right, guys, you're listening to the Chat with Traders podcast. Please welcome my guest, Paul Singh. Paul, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you, Aaron? I am doing awesome. And you know why? Because I finally have you on the podcast. I was looking oh, I through. Know. I, know. <laughs> I think you, you, asked, you contacted me. Uh, about two or three podcasts in when you were doing this. Uh, and I had no idea what it was. And, you know, with me, I don't do a lot of this kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I, I had it in mind this whole time, but uh, uh, seeing what you've done, man, it's amazing. Uh, it, all these tr great traders that you've had, uh, some of them are actually my personal kind of idols. So to be even included in this is just awesome. Oh, thank you very much, man. It means a lot. And um, yeah, I mean, I think I was lo actually looking through my emails earlier today, um, as some of the emails we've had back and forth. And I originally contacted you, it was over 12 months ago. So I'm glad we could uh, we could tee this up. It's finally happening. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, ex I'm excited about this. <laughs> so I've been hassling you a lot uh, since then. But anyway, Paul, thank you very much for making the time to speak with me today. Now, we always kick this off by starting from when you first got into trading. I'm going to take a bit of a guess here, but I think you were a law student prior to being a trader. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but regardless, share with us how you first got started in trading and what sparked your interest. Yeah, law school is when I really got into it. Uh, I would say college is when I, I really started trading. I, I did basically what what just about everybody does, where you, you get into, especially back then, there, there's more information now, but back then it was all about long-term holds. Uh, you know, I started to do that and I realized, you know, I'm not making money. I don't want to look, you know, 30 years down the road. Uh, so that kind of led me to trading. And I noticed a few things. Uh, back then, you know, everyone was getting into Microsoft and I think it was Oracle and this was the, the 90s. I'm 40 years old now. So this is back when I was in college and I noticed uh, there was a stock called Gotchox, which was a local uh, clothing company. And uh, I got that just because it was a local company and that thing ramped up. And these companies that everybody knows about uh, didn't. And that kind of sparked my interest. That, hey, maybe uh, there's another way to play this. So I, I always had that in mind. Uh, and then, yeah, when I got into law school, there was that internet boom. And, it, you know, it was 
it was awesome while I was in it, but it was probably the worst time to learn about trading. Uh, because basically, you didn't need to know anything to make money. And the problem is that was awesome while you're through it, but it wasn't going to last. So I actually started, uh, my first year of law school, I started with $5,000. And that thing ran up to almost $200,000 in a matter of months. It was about two or three months. Uh, and you know, I'm thinking, hey, who needs law school? I'm going to be a millionaire here. I've already made $200,000. Uh, know, I, I got an expensive apartment. It was a penthouse. with I had uh, professional athletes were my neighbors and living large. Uh, and then reality hit when that uh, boom went bust. And basically that $200,000 went you know, slowly to $100,000 to $50,000 back to nothing. So uh, I like to look at it to make me feel happy that I only lost five thousand dollars, which is actually what I lost. Uh, but you know, it was up around two hundred thousand, about one eighty-five. So that was a wake-up call, and, and then I, you know, I kind of went back and forth. I was busy, you know, with law school and you know, starting a career. But I always came back to trading, and, and the second time. Now this is my second uh, time blowing up an account. So that was my first time. Now I, I came back again. And this time I'd done a little research, uh, you know, I read some books and, and books aren't going to tell you a whole lot. Uh, they can give you a basic foundation. Uh, and it wasn't like today where you have access to everything, you know, all these great traders and mentors. Back then it was really difficult in the 90s. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I started trading, I started to put some of this stuff in practice. I, I didn't still have a fully kind of functioning trading uh, process. But I did trade it much better. I ended up blowing it a, an account again. So any any of you guys who are having problems, it's really all about perseverance. You know, you're going to go through these periods where you blow up an account or two, and, and uh, it's really kind of your learning process. So I blew up two accounts, uh, and, and you know, went back and forth with trading. And then it was that third real attempt. Pro this was probably now 2004, 2005, somewhere in there where everything really started to click for me and, and everything I was learning kind of came together. Uh, and, you know, again, I started with, it was always $5,000. I, I started with $5,000 and it was about, I was an attorney at this time. So it was a, a five or six year process uh, of this part-time trading, swing trading, trading around my job. And it took about five or six years, you know, slowly grinding it out. I had a different mentality about trading. It was no longer hitting that lottery. I still kind of had that in my mind from that first time when I was in the middle of that internet boom. Uh, and, and this time when I traded, there was another boom. There was a commodities boom. And there's always something around the corner. And this time it was a commodities boom. And this time, because of my experience with the internet boom, I knew how to handle it. And I actually kept my profits. Uh, so it was really just grinding it, grinding it. It took me about five or six years then. Uh, in about, at about 2011, uh, I broke and went full time. Okay. So 2011, what year did you get started? Like how long in before you actually did go make that jump to go full time? So I would say, you know, I was trading from the late 90s. Uh, I would say I got really serious. And when I talk about that light bulb moment, that's when I really got serious and uh, about trading. That was around 2005, 2006. So it was about six years. Okay. Okay. So in the space of about four years, you'd mentioned that you'd blown up about three accounts. Yeah. Why do you think it was that you kept pushing on and kept trying to, to make something of this whole trading thing? Uh, you know, I, I think it was a challenge for me. It, it was something once I once I get into something, it's, I just go full into it, uh, and, and that's just by, been my mentality with everything. Where I just don't give up. Sometimes that can be good. Uh, sometimes it can be bad. And, and with trading, uh, and you want you have to love it too. And, and I, I love trading, so uh, you know it was interesting to me, and, and I wasn't going to give up. Um, I can't I probably came close a few times. Uh, but always, you know, just kind of push through. And I think part of it too is I was seeing progress. So, you know, the first time, uh, you know, that was just dumb luck and, and I knew I wasn't trading well. The, the second time I actually saw that I was improving as a trader and when I blew up that account, I could identify exactly, you know, what I was doing wrong. And, and then I said, okay, you know what, I don't need to give up here because I know if I correct these mistakes, I can be a successful trader. Okay. So tell us about the point when you actually felt confident to go full time. Like, how, what was it that made you feel comfortable that you could now rely on trading for a full time income? Was there anything that 
convinced you that you're like, okay, I'm safe now to, to take the leap? A uh, couple. One, I'd been profitable every year since then, so that was comforting. Uh, two was I really waited until I had enough money where I didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, you don't want to be trading to pay the rent. And I, I was really patient. Uh, you know, when I, when I turned 5,000 to 100,000, that was the first time I actually seriously thought about going full time. Uh, you know, and, and I, I looked at the finances, you know, I just thought to myself, you know what, I know if I, if I break off here, uh, I'm not going to be trading properly. I'm going to be thinking about how much money I need to be pulling out. So I made the decision when I go full time, uh, it, I don't want to have to take money out. Um, or if I do have to take it out, it, it won't really affect me. So, uh, I basically just kept trading until I, I knew I'd be comfortable, uh, with the amount I could trade. Okay, so you said at the start of your answer there that you had uh, enough money. Uh, how much was enough money? You don't have to give us a dollar value, but like in terms of covering your living expenses, how long did you allow? Like, did you have enough money sitting in a separate account from your trading account that would support you for two years if you didn't make any money over that time or, or something like that? Yeah, so, you know, I think it's a little easier for me because, you know, my wife works, she has a good job. Uh, we have quite a bit saved up. So, uh, in, in that regard, uh, I, I didn't have to worry about it too much. Too much. Uh, but the entire time I was thinking, you know, if something did happen and I needed to take money out and rely on my trading, I would need at least mid six figures. Uh, and that would hold me over for two or three years. And I think anybody going full time, I think that's the biggest mistake people make it is not having a big enough account. Uh, and you realize, you know, you think about it while you're working. Yeah, I can break off here. Uh, but you don't realize until and even even with me where I knew I had that safety net of uh, a savings. I, I had a savings then my trading accounts and then, you know, my wife works. So uh, that's all good. Uh, but even still with all that and realizing that, I, you know, if I traded badly, uh, you know, I wouldn't be on the street. Still, when I gave up that paycheck, it was very difficult. Uh, knowing that my only source of income for me personally is my trading, uh, it was difficult. So uh, for anyone listening who's thinking about this uh, and you're thinking about that dollar amount, it has to be, uh, you have to think about where will you be and it's not always just covering your expenses. It's more of a mental thing. Uh, like, sure, okay, I have enough to cover my expenses, but where will you really feel comfortable mentally where you're not even thinking about, uh, you, know, you know, your expenses while you're going to be trading? Because once you, once you do that, it, it's going to be, uh, you're, you're going to start making poor decisions. And as traders, it's all about decision making. You know, it's not like, uh, sometimes I look back at when, you know, I, when I was working uh, full time, and I had that paycheck, even though you, you are making decisions, you, you know you're still going to get your paycheck. Uh, but with trading, every single decision you make affects, affects the outcome. Uh, so it's a decision-making game. So you want to do everything you can to make sure you're making good decisions. So uh, you know, I would say whatever you're thinking about in terms of how much to use, maybe even, even double that amount so you'll be, feel comfortable. Right. I think that's some really great advice there, Paul. And you said that when you did go full time, you experienced um, it was very difficult. What were some of those difficulties there? Obviously, you outlined that uh, the decision making you know, impacts whether you make money today or not. But were there any difficulties like uh, that you weren't expecting? Um, maybe things that other people who may be thinking of going full time should expect? You know what, what, what got me, and I never expected this, is uh, just the boredom. I wouldn't say the boredom uh, for swing trading if you're swing trading full time. Because what I was used to is having so much to do in the day and, and then fitting in my trading through that. So I was always doing something. And now, you know, I'm sitting in my office and, you know, with swing trading, you know, I'm holding positions anywhere from two days to three months. And once I've put in my trades, during the trading day, there really wasn't a whole lot to do. And you almost feel like it's really all mental. You know, you know, you know logically that you, you know, you're doing the right thing. These trades work out. You're going to make money. But you're sitting there and, and doing nothing. And you just feel like, you know, what am I doing now? I, what am I, how do I fill my day? And, and that's not something I, I ever expected. 
Uh, so I, I got into day trading at that point. So now I swing and day trade. I'd never day traded before, but that was kind of the impetus for me to start day trading. And uh, coincidentally at that time, uh, Kanal, who I'd mentored uh, in the mid-2000s, I, I didn't even know this, but he had his own you know, big website he's created, and you've interviewed him uh, in the past. Uh, he, he a really good trader, and he contacted me out of the blue, and it just happened to be perfect timing for me, uh, just helping me fill out the day. So I, that's that's something I would I would recommend to anybody who's going to go full time is think really think about other things you can be doing because uh, what you don't want is one that mental uh, idea that you're just sitting there doing nothing, and two for a swing trader. And, and this is why part-time trading is great for a swing trader because you're not sitting there watching every tick. Um, and you know when you're swing trading, there's a lot of back and forth. And, and some of the pullbacks are, you know, on the way to your target, uh, you can start, you know, it can start playing with your mind. You pull out a good position just because you're sitting there watching everything, maybe on different time frames. Uh, so if you have something else to do, uh, that really helps in, in terms of allowing you to you know, play out these swings the way you'd want to. Okay, yeah, that's 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 a really great point that you bring up, and you know I can see how a lot of people actually wouldn't expect that, uh, like you mentioned there, uh, especially as a swing trader, because I mean really most of your work is done before or mar- or after the market closes. Exactly, you know I, I always thought when when I talk about swing, you know the perspiration, the hard work is done post market in the evenings, pre market, that's where the hard work is done. Uh, you know, I say that the, the easiest part, if you're doing it correctly, the easiest part of, of the whole trading process is actually putting on the trade as a swing trader, because you've already already you you know exactly what you're looking for. You're basically just waiting for the setups to emerge, and and when the stock hits that price, you just you know you're going to get in at that point. So so the the intraday stuff you're doing is actually as a swing trader the easiest part of trading. The hard part is later in the day when you're figuring out. You know the market, you know sector analysis, the setups you're going to trade. That's the difficult part. So yeah, that those market hours are actually the easiest part of trading, and the, and the part you kind of need to fill up with other things. For sure, for sure. So Paul, before we get into more about how you're trading today, I really want to ask you, maybe if you can summarize for us, what changes in your earlier years did you make to your trading which led to the greatest improvements, like any aha moments that really changed the game for you? You know, I realized that trading is more than stock picking. That was the light bulb moment for me. And, you know, you, can, you see this all, all the time, whether it's day trading, swing trading. You can have, you know, a bunch of people trading the same stocks, uh, but some people are profitable and some people aren't. And, and why is that? Um, and I've broke it down to three different areas. So basically, you have the stock picking and the setups, and actually, that is the least important part when it comes to trading. Uh, and then two is the risk management, and three is trade management. And the part that you can teach just about anybody, I would say even in a month or two, you know, if you've got average intelligence. Uh, you know, and most traders have studied other things, and you know, studying to be an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, finance, whatever it is, is ten times harder than learning the actual setups of trading. Uh, so you can learn that very quickly, and you've probably seen this all the time. Where uh, there's a bunch of trading trivia buffs or, or knowledge buffs that know everything about trading. I mean, I, I know guys who can name every single cat- candle pattern out there. And, and I could, if I had to name them, I could probably name five or ten. Uh, but but that's not what's important. It's knowing how to trade. Uh, so the setups, I would say, is one third of it. Risk management is one third. That's another part that's easy to teach somebody. You know, just understanding probabilities, understanding risk reward. Not really difficult. Some people have trouble applying it, but in general, most people can get that down. So it's those two aspects. And then there's trade management. And, and trade management is what separates winning and losing traders, mostly because that's where uh, the whole mental game, psychology, comes into play. Uh, so this, this is what we're talking about. You know, once you're in a trade, you know, micromanaging your positions. You know, where the fear and greed comes in, taking uh, too small of a profit. You know, allowing your stops to get too loose. All, all this kind of stuff is all based on fear, greed, and it's really related to how you manage the trade. 
So, so I think that's the area where most people have to work on. And, and that's, that was it for me when I realized that and I realized that it's not all about stock picking. It, it doesn't even matter. You could give me a stock to trade. And, and if I know how to manage it, manage the risk and then manage the trade, I can probably make money without even having a setup for that stock. So that was really my light bulb moment. Okay. Very well said. I like that answer. All right, Paul. Well, let's talk about how you're trading now. So if you can, take a minute to explain your style slash methodology of trading. You know, I, I've been through so many styles and, and with swing, I would say the 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 overall idea for me is is taking like complex ideas and making it as simple as possible because we've talked about decision making and, and you see it all the time where you know people have all these different things they're looking for and it becomes really hard to make decisions based on them. So uh, overall, I try to make it as simple as, as possible. And then I've, I've kind of laid it out for myself where I've got a basket of, say, 10 or 15 different setups that I trade regularly. And, and basically, the style then is adapting to what's going on in the market. So I'm very focused on what's going on in the market, uh, what's going on with, with sectors, uh, basically tracking money flow. So I want to see where the big boys are going, uh, kind of tracking that and, and then kind of jumping on their backs. So whatever setups are working for that is, is what I'm going to trade. And, you know, one common question I always get asked is, what is your favorite setup? And I usually don't give them the answer they want because my answer is I don't have a favorite setup uh, or my setup is what's working today. And, and, you know, the setup that's working right now is not going to work six months from now and might not have worked six months prior. But, you know, the setups I was trading in 2008 don't work now. Uh, in, in the market we're in right now, if I say breakouts are my favorite setups, uh, you know, in the market we're in now, breakups, almost every breakout is going to fail. So uh, you need to be adaptable. And I would say that is kind of my overall strategy where I've got, I'm really paying attention to the market, how they relate to stocks. And I've got these setups and, and basically, you know, like someone with a tool belt, you've got all these tools and, and knowing when to pull out uh, that specific setup that will work in that market. Okay. So 10 to 15 setups, are those setups that you've kind of discovered over time or have you always traded that amount like 10 to 15 you know, it, it's always developing yeah and, and to be a successful trader you know you'll, you'll see traders who will do good for one or two years they develop this awesome setup uh, and then inevitably in a few years it's going to stop working uh, because of the market maybe because people have figured out this setup and then you have to develop more and more setups so yeah starting you know you know, way in the mid 2000s, I was almost exclusively trading breakouts. Uh, that's all I did, either breakouts or breakdowns. Uh, then, when, and that was mostly in commodities when they were all ramping up. And, and then after that, you know, the breakouts weren't working as well. So it was breakout pullbacks. So I added that to the list of stocks I was trading. Then it was moving averages. Everything was based around moving averages. And, and if you're trading now, you're probably noticing that all this moving average stuff that used to work so great. Uh, way back when is not working quite as well now, or there's different variations. So you always have to be studying and seeing what's working now. Now, you know, whoever the market makers or the algos are, they know these. everyone's trading on these moving averages and we'll just stop them out underneath. So you can game that and now kind of figure out how to play the moving averages differently. So yeah, it's kind of a, a process where you're constantly, um, you know, adding new setups according to what's working in the market. So, uh, you know, six or seven years ago, a, a, a trade that a setup that I use a lot now uh, is remounts, uh, especially in a market like this. So basically, you know, a stock will uh, go below a moving average and a lot of times it's stop gunning and, and then it'll remount that moving average once everyone's been stopped out. That's a trade you know, six or seven years ago, I would never have done, had no idea about it. Uh, but now that's what's working for me. So yeah, it, these, these setups are constantly developing. Okay. So what markets are you most active in? Obviously, um, you trade a lot of equities. Are you also still active in futures or commodities? Not anymore. I, I used to trade commodities and futures. Now it's exclusively stocks. Okay. And is there a reason for that? 
You know, I, I have a belief that you have to master what you're doing. So, so basically, if you have too many things you're trying to learn, it's just too difficult. You really want to master uh, one area. So for me, you know, I, I used to do options uh, and trade futures and this other stuff. But now I, I feel like I've mastered this area. So I, I'm just sticking to that. Right. And, and was there any reason why you lent towards uh, stocks and equities over going exclusively to futures? Uh, you know, part of it, I, I think, is the fact that they're structured hours. Uh, I would find that, you know, with, with if something is, is trading around the clock, uh, I feel like I always needed to be doing it. I just didn't like that. So, so even, you know, I've dabbled in pre-market and I'm actually one of my every year – I set a new thing to study, uh, and and this year it's pre market trading. Uh, so you know I, I do branch out in, in different things, but uh, maybe I, I think more than anything it's these the defined hours. Okay, so what is it about the pre market that that's appealing to you right now? Well, you know I, I think part of it is is I'm doing more day trading, and I'm start I trade a lot at the open, and I started to see that. Pre-market activity, uh, when trading past the open, you, you see these areas pre-market that have an effect on the post-market trading. Uh, so I started watching it uh, for that reason, and, and as I started watching it, I, I started to see these setups uh, kind of emerging. And and with me, uh, usually I tr- I like to learn things on my own, so I, I'm sure there's some strategies out there. Uh, but with me, I start watching something, and then if, if something starts to come to me, I start to see these patterns, I'll start working at it. And that's kind of what I'm doing now with, with the pre-market trading. Sure, okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I'd like to ask you, what role does technical analysis play in your trading? I see you overlay a few indicators on your charts just from skimming through your blog. Uh, how do these help you? You know, I, I guess it's, it depends on how you uh, define technical analysis. If if we're talking about indicators, uh, I was very indicator based in the beginning, and I've moved. I think as you get more and more experienced, you realize you don't need them quite as much. So now I'm based mostly on price action and volume, and that's basically what indicators are measuring anyway. So I, I think I can see just by looking at the chart without the indicator, I can see that. So. You know, I get asked all the time, like, you know, what is your Bollinger Band strategy or how are you using stochastics? And really, uh, I've, I used to use Bollinger Bands and I've taken those completely off my charts now. I still keep stochastics on uh, just to kind of confirm what I'm seeing if I think something is oversold or overbought. Uh, but really, I'm using, as I've progressed, I'm using less and less indicators. And I liken it to, uh, this is almost in every field. Where when you're a beginner, and even when you're a successful beginner, uh, you're looking at things in a more complex way. And, and as you progress and become an expert, you really learn to simplify and tune out the noise and what you don't need. Uh, you, you see this if you're into art, where you see a lot of painters, when they first started, uh, a lot of lines, a, a lot of un, un, unnecessary stuff in a painting or a, a drawing. And as they progress, you see less and less lines but the lines they use have much more of an impact. They know what is going to have an impact, what is useful and what is not. And it's the same thing with traders. You see this all the time with traders and a lot of traders I've worked with where in the beginning, you know, they've got layers and layers of indicators and, and moving averages. I, you know, I've seen people using 10 different moving averages and you can't even make sense of where you, you should go with this. And, and uh, I've been, it's really been a process of taking things off rather than adding things. Sure. Okay. Now, just when I mentioned your blog there, I also remembered that when I was on there, I saw a phrase that kept popping up over and over again. And that phrase was, set it and forget it. Yes. Could you expand on why this is relevant for traders and maybe talk about the subject, uh, which I think it ties into very nicely, of micromanaging? Exactly. It's all about micromanaging positions. So you can have, you can go in. uh, And this happens a lot with, with losing traders. Uh, you know, we, and again, we talked about the the trade management aspect, where you can have the the perfect stock, you've managed your risk properly, you've got the perfect plan going in. You know, say stock X is at 100, I'm going to get out at 115. Uh, that's where resistance is. 
uh, you know, I'm going to get out at 95. So I've got three to one on my reward to risk. You go in with the perfect plan. And then what happens once the trade get ex- gets executed? You, you, you start watching every single tick. Uh, and, and maybe you start watching a different time frame. And on that faster time frame, something looks meaningful. But if you think about it on the time frame you were, you were looking at, it really wouldn't have had an impact. Uh, and that's, that's where the set it and forget it comes in. You, you basically, you have this plan. You've done the hard work already. And we were talking about this. You know, The hard work is in the preparation. So you've done the hard work. You know what you should be doing here. Uh, so you set the trade. You, you have it laid out. And then really just forget about it. Uh, and that can be hard when you're a full-time trader and you're watching, you know, every tick. So it's good to have other outlets. And you know, for me, it was day trading that gets my mind off the swing trading. Um, but you, you need something else so you're not watching every tick. And and that's why, actually, it, it can be easier to part-time swing trade than full-time swing trade uh, because whatever you're doing outside of trading gets your mind off it. Uh, so set it, forget it, and, and that's I think the biggest trading leak for traders is micromanaging positions where, uh, you know, you, a, a, number of, a number of ways you can do it. One is the stock moves against you and, and we talked about fear and, and fear is one of these biggest motivators for us here. And the stock moves, you know, you had that stop at 95 but it gets down to 97 and you just pull out of what really was still a good position. That's just the natural volatility of the stock. Uh, same thing with taking profits. Uh, you know, way back when, the way our minds are developed is to take a quick profit because you know it's kind of the antithesis of what we should be doing as traders because we the way we've been hard, hardwired, you know, going going back millions of years. So you know, the, instead of waiting till one fifteen, we get out at one o five, and you know, with usually if you're swing trading with a one to one reward to risk, you're not going to be a successful trader. So you really have to get that that kind of set it and forget it mentality in mind. It really helps in in your head. Uh, try not to watch every little tick. Uh, and, and you know you can you can be great at picking these stocks, but if you can't trade them, if you can't get past this uh, your own psychology, uh, you're not going to be a successful trader. Absolutely. So let's unpack this a little further. Could you share with us what is on your plan before going into any trade? So what are some of the things that you're setting before you even get into the trade? Okay. Uh, well, starting from the beginning, the first thing I do is do a, a market analysis. So, you know, I'm seeing what the market's doing and, you know, the saying is what 70 or 80% of stocks move is the market. Uh, so I want to be in stocks that are generally, unless it's earnings based or something like that, I, I want to be in stocks that are in line and leading the market. So I'm looking for that. Uh, every week I do a sector analysis to see where the money is flowing. I mean, we talked about money flow. I'm really focusing on that. And from there, I'm building an overall watch list. Uh, again, this is for decision making, you know, narrowing down that, those you know, thousands of stocks that are out there into something manageable uh, so you make better decisions. So I try to keep it anywhere from 50 to 150 stocks, depending on how the market is. So I've got that initial watch list that I'm looking at daily and it's constantly changing, uh, you know, depending on what stocks are, are, are moving on a daily basis. So it's pretty organic, but I've got that overall watch list. And then going into that trading day, I'm taking that list and that list is not full of stocks that are right at uh, you know the, the the entry level that I want. They're setting up, and, and I'm kind of stocking them. You know, like you know, a, a lion would stock a deer. It's kind of the same thing. You're, you're watching these, waiting for them to set up, and then every evening or in the morning, I'm trying to narrow it down to five or you know five to fifteen stocks somewhere in there uh, that I'll be watching during the day to see if they set up. And, and with every one of these stocks, uh, I have a plan written out where I have the, the entry range, I have the stop range, and I have my target range. And, and this really helps with the position sizing. And, and a lot of this is a, a really simple thing to do. And a lot of traders don't do this. So uh, they get a stock they want to buy, and the, it hits the price they want. And you know they, they kind of panic. They, they, they want to jump in. And they're having to think, okay, what is my position size? What do you know? And it leads to bad decisions. So I have that laid out beforehand. I know, okay, I'm, you know, I only want to risk a thousand dollars. So if I have, 
a ten dollar stop, I can only take this many shares. So that's all laid out already for me. I know the position size I'm going to take. I know where the price needs to be. I know where I'm going to put my stop, where my 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 target is, and, and it's all ready for me. So that then when that happens during the day, now there there's some things that could change what I'm looking at. So it's a guide. Uh, you know, maybe something happens where the market is not doing what I wanted to do, uh, something in the sector or whatever it is. So it can change, but at least I have that framework that allows me to make less decisions when it's time to trade. And then it, it becomes, it actually becomes very easy to make the trade and there's no anxiety. And that's part of the problem. I think a lot of traders, when it time comes time to make the trade, they have anxiety. Uh, because they're having to process all this stuff. So I, I try to make it so I have to process as little as possible when I'm actually making the trade. Okay. I think that's that's a really great answer. When you say you write it out, are you actually – how are you doing that? Is it an Excel spreadsheet or do you have some other software or are you actually writing it pen and paper? You know, it, you – be in a journal and now it's an Evernote. So, so that's basically all. Yeah, it's it's nothing compliment com- complicated where I'm creating spreadsheets or anything like that. Okay, Evernote, very cool. All right, so I know an ongoing challenge for many traders is where should I put my stop? Yes. Can you shine some light on this? Like, what's your rule of thumb or guide to placing stops? Yeah, you know, a, a common mistake that traders make is. They're only thinking, if they're using risk analysis, they're only thinking about their risk. And, uh, you know, you, you, you have to take into account, one, the natural volatility of a stock. Uh, you know, if a stock is not just going to move in the direction you want it to, or if it's going to get to a point, it usually doesn't get up there in a straight line. It's going back and forth. So I always take into account how volatile the stock is. Uh, I used to just look at this is going back, you know, to the 2005, 2006 when you could do this. I would just look at where, say, a support level is, and I would place my stop right there. And the problem with that now is these methods have become so common that everybody is doing that. So what happens? You see this all the time. Stops get taken out, and then the stock will move in the way uh, you think it's going to move. So. Uh, what's really in the last few years, what's really become key to me is not only thinking about my own risk, thinking about where support levels are, but also thinking about where everybody else is placing their stops and making sure I'm not placing it right at that level. So I, I think right now that, and that's, I think the biggest flaw a lot of traders currently are making is they're thinking exactly like everybody else is. And, and you know, they, they end up, you know, having the same issues that everyone else does. So uh, I would say think about that when you're placing the stop. Where is everybody else placing it? And don't obviously don't place it at that level. Uh, another thing I'll do is if I feel like there's going to be stop gunning, uh, I'll wait for it to happen. I, I actually won't enter it where I was planning to enter. I'll wait for that stop gunning. And then, and, and that's why I do a lot of this remount trading now, uh, is I'll, I'll wait for everyone to get stopped out. Then once it remounts that level, then I'll actually enter. So I, I don't have to worry about that so much in, in entering the stop. Okay. So just two things off that. Taking a, an approach like that, which you kind of describe as the remount approach, is there some risk that you may actually move, uh, sorry, that you may actually miss the move? Yes, yes, and that that that's happened to me a few times. So yeah, yeah. So th- there's a couple of ways to play it. You know, you can you can take a. Sometimes I'll take a smaller position, and allow myself to hold through the stop gunning, and then when it, it that way, if it does move without at the, the stop gunning happening, at least I'm in it, and I can always add to it later if if the trade is working for me. Uh, so you know, I'll enter you know a half size position. Uh, let the stop gunning happen and then and make it a full size position or add to it later. But yeah, I have missed moves uh, because of that. But I, I think overall, uh, right now, it, it's a really good strategy to use. And I'm sure, you know, this is going to get figured out pretty soon. And, and then we'll, uh, you know, I'll adjust and do something else. Sure. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to ask about was you said that you take volatility into consideration for where you place your stops. Do you have some sort of rule of thumb for that, or does it really vary for each different stock? You know, 
I used to be very objective about this and I'd look at ATR and different volatility measures and then calculate that. And, and through experience now, you know, I, it, it comes with experience where I just look at it and I can see the price action and, and have a good idea of where I need to place it. Basically just looking at the price action now. Uh, before I was u- using other measures like, like ATR and other volatility measures. Okay. And is that something you might suggest for traders who are less experienced, who maybe don't have quite that level of feel for the market, for for how they place their stops, like to actually calculate a formula? You know, I would say if you can start eyeballing it, I know most people like something objective, but you know, even when you, you use these objective measures, they're not any better. For me, they weren't any better. I actually went back and and, and analyzed it and saw, is this working for me? And I found it, it wasn't adding anything to what I was doing. Basically, it, it's very simple. Uh, you know, if you're trading Netflix, Netflix usually has you know a four to five dollar range, the intraday range, uh, which it doesn't right now. But let's say it has a four to five dollar intraday range, um, and you've put your stop at two po- two points away. Very simple. It's common sense. You know, there's a good chance you're going to get stopped out. So I, I would say just it, it comes with uh, experience. We always talk about pattern recognition. The stuff comes with time. Just working at it every day and, and you just start to see things. Okay, just hold that thought for a moment. We're going to take a very short break here to thank our sponsor for this week's episode. And our sponsor is Trading Technologies. Now, you know, as well as I do, as traders, we seek an advantage wherever we can get one. And trading technologies provide a superior tech advantage to futures traders through a world-class platform and an enhanced suite of professional-grade tools. Some of the standout features of the TT platform include the fact it's a purely cloud-based platform. This means there's no need to install software, just log in online and trade from virtually anywhere on any device. Extensive charting and analytics is also available through the TT platform, giving you access to a wide range of chart styles, drawing tools, indicators, and years of free historical data. You also have the ability to automate your trading. You can build, test, and trade your own algos with ADL. The ADL is the Algo Design Lab, and there is no manual coding required. Another great advantage is the fast, low latency trade execution via a global network of trading technologies co-located servers. So to learn more, go to trade.tt now and take 30 seconds to sign up for a free trial with trading technologies. Again, try the TT platform free today at trade.tt. Now a question I think that many swing traders might often ask, uh, especially swing traders, how do you react when let's say, okay, so just as an example, you're in a long position, you've been in it for a few days, then all of a sudden shit hits the fan in China. You know the US market is likely to have a sharp sell-off in the upcoming session. What do you do and how do you react to this? Yeah, and I, I've been through that. And this last year it happened with Google. And uh, when I was holding through that, I got uh, a ton of people telling me I was crazy to do that. Uh, but First of all, if you're trading part time and you have a hard stop, there's nothing you can do. You're going to get stopped out, right? When when it gaps down. But if you can be kind of watching it, you know, if you've got your job, but you can you can kind of monitor, especially with cell phones and all that kind of stuff, you can monitor a little bit. Or if you're trading full time, what I like to do is have a mental stop, and I call it basically, you know, the gap down strategy, where you see a lot of times there's overreactions to this stuff, right? Uh, something happens in China and, and we were talking about fear before and there's your personal understanding your own mental makeup and fear, but it's also very important to understand, uh, the fear of them in, in the market. And you know, oftentimes with this stuff, uh, there's going to be an overreaction. You know, something happens over there that has nothing to do with the stock you're trading, but there's going to be an overreaction. And a lot of times with these overreactions pretty quickly after that initial overreaction, people come to their senses and say, wait a minute, this isn't affecting us here. Why was I so worried? Um, so, and that, that's kind of happening right now. Uh, but so when something like that happens, what I'll do is even if it's obliterated my stop and now my risk reward is all screwed up and I would want to get out, usually that's the worst place to get out. And, and that's where all the, the you know, call them weak hands, that's where they're getting out. And if you can sometimes stick through that, 
you know, there comes a point where you have to get out. So what I'll do is I'll watch that gap down and then I'll give it a little room. And if it can hold that level and then bounce back, I'll stick with it. And, and maybe I get part of, you know, the gap down back or maybe it'll reverse completely. Uh, the August 24th sellout sell-off was the big one. So uh, I was in Google, at Google and Amazon at that point, uh, and, and they looked fantastic. Both of them had blowout earnings. They broke out at really nice levels. Uh, and in the Bulls on Wall Street trade report service, you know, I, I give trade alerts to all the trades. And so I was in that and a number of members were in that trade. And the market, you know, gapped down and it took these guys down with it. And that's the exact strategy I used with that where you know it, it had obliterated my stops, where my stops would have been if they had I had a hard stop, but I did have a mental stop, and I just held through that level, and they bounced back and ended up being big winners. Where there was a lot of panic there, and, and a lot of people just jumped out right there without even thinking. And part of that is one, people are thinking about the risk, uh, but part of it is this kind of fear, and again, the mental makeup. Where I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes on a losing trade. Uh, you know, you have all this anxiety, and once you get out of that trade, there's a sense of relief. Even even though you've had this big loss, just being out of it makes you feel good. Uh, John Tudor uh, Jones, a, a great trader, talks about this all the time. That uh, we're looking, you know, traders are always looking to increase their happiness, uh, and sometimes doing something stupid and just getting out of it, uh, while you should be pissed off about that, really you feel good. It, somehow it makes you feel good. Uh, and that's what happened to a lot of people during that period. So I would say anytime something like that happens, stay calm. Don't panic like everyone else is and, and have this process in mind. So you should have this preparation kind of laid out. You should know. Uh, it, it's like, you know, a lot of, you know, sports athletes. Uh, they practice and practice for every situation that can happen. That's why the good teams are so good. You see their attention to detail. So you should have laid out. If I have a gap down here, uh, how do I handle this? And, and you want to get to the point where when that happens, uh, you know, I talk about this with my wife talks about this where she says, I don't know if you've had a winning day or losing day. You, you sound the same all the time. And, and I record videos in the morning for all my members and the same thing. They'll tell me, you know, uh, just recently when, when, when this big gap down happened, uh, you know, you don't sound panicked at all. It's because of experience. I've been through this many times, but also I have this process laid out where I know exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm not really thinking about it. I've simplified this whole thing and I know exactly how to react to this. Okay. Okay. Another really great answer there, Paul. Uh, let's do one more question before we, we wind this down. I know you've got uh, family visiting, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I think this question is going to tie in with that last one really well. Um, and it is very important. How do you juggle positions between longs and shorts being mindful not to have too many positions in one direction? Is this something you're mindful of or really not bothered? I don't worry about balancing it usually. Uh, unless I'm unsure of the market. Uh, but generally, I'm thinking about the market and then I'll have a bias towards what I want to do. Uh, so right now, let's say, let's take right now as an example, you know, we've had, because of China and oil, we've had this huge rundown and the market is extremely oversold right now. Uh, so I'm thinking about longs because of that. It's, it's a tough time here to get short. Uh, so I have a bias in terms of what I'm looking to do, uh, you know, and then if we get a little bounce, depending on, you know, how the bounce is acting, how stocks are reacting, maybe at that point I say, okay, you know, we've had a little bounce here and now I can initiate some shorts. So, uh, so I'll be taking more shorts, but in terms of actually balancing the counts between long and shorts, I, I don't do that. Uh, you know, a lot of times what happens is people have this idea that they should be balanced and, and what happens and you basically break even. So you, you have to understand the market and, and, and be able to analyze that and know kind of which direction you should be trading. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right, Paul. Well, seeing as we're right into 2016 now, I know your goal for the year is to get more involved in the pre-market action. Do you have any, any tips or pointers for others about how to set goals for the year ahead? Uh, yeah, you know, a, a lot of times people have goals, but then they don't have a plan 
on, on what to do to get to that goal. So with everything I've done, going back to my part-time trading, you know, I had a plan of what I was going to do. And just something simple like this, uh, you know, my goal for 2016, one, I keep it very simple. Every year, it's one thing. And I want to master that thing. So when, when you're setting these goals, think about mastery, not learning, you know, haphazardly five or 10 different things, focus on one or two things and just master them. So with me, it's pre-market action. So I'm actually getting up a little earlier now where, you know, the market here on the West coast opens at six 30. I used to get up at five. Now I'm getting up at four and I'm spending that time every day, just immersing myself, uh, into mastering, uh, pre-market trading. Uh, so, and, and I've laid out, laid out a plan of how I'm going to do it and the kind of the things I'm looking for. Uh, so keep it simple, have a plan laid out, make it actionable, uh, and then look for results. So uh, every month I'm reviewing uh, how I'm doing. So right now I'm not actually trading what I'm seeing, but I'm jotting things down. That's my first step. Uh, I'm kind of jotting down what I'm seeing and getting an idea. Uh, then my next step will be paper trading. I know a lot of people kind of poo-poo paper trading, but I, I think paper trading is a really good learning tool. So my next step, uh, incremental here, will be paper trading. And then once I'm good at, good at that, then I will go to swing, uh, actually really trading it. And I've kind of got a six-month plan of getting to that point. Awesome. Love it. All right, Paul, well, it's been really, really good to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, Can man, you thank you for having me. <laughs> no trouble whatsoever. I'm glad we could make this happen. Where can listeners go to find out more about you? Okay, so bullsonwallstreet.com. Uh, it's Canal's site. I run the swing trading portion of that. So you can just go to bullsonwallstreet.com. If you're interested in swing trading, part-time trading, uh, just go in there. There's a free trial and you know you can contact me. You can contact Kanal. We answer everything back. Uh, so you can see me there. And then I also have my old uh, blog, which I keep updated. And that's the marketspeculator.blogspot.com. And uh, you can contact me you know, through any of those uh, means. Okay. And you're also on Twitter as well. What's your handle? Uh, what is my handle? Uh, Paul J. Singh. I'm pretty sure it's, it's Paul J. I go on it every day, but I don't remember my handle. I think it's Paul J. Singh. Okay, sure. Well, I'll make sure to include all those links uh, in the show notes at chatwithtraders.com forward slash 58. And I'll just point out, there's actually an interview with Kunal, uh, you know, the head honcho there at Bulls on Wall Street. He was on episode 20, a really great interview. So I'll also link to that in the show notes and uh, you guys can check that out. Now, Paul, I've got to ask you, um, and I always forget to do this at the very beginning. I've got to, got to work on that. But are you open to answering any questions that listeners may have in the comments section uh, of this interview? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Throw, throw anything you, you're thinking about, any questions you have, yeah, I'll, I'll answer them right away. No problem. Very cool. Okay, so guys, chatwithtraders.com forward slash 58. Scroll to the bottom of the page, leave a question in the comments area, and Paul will um, answer that for you. So, Make sure to take advantage of that. All right, Paul, again, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Have a good evening. Oh, yeah, this was awesome and a long time coming. So, yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Aaron. You've come to the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but don't worry, more great episodes are on the way. To stay updated with each great new episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, and we'd love it if you leave us a rating and review. We'll see you next time on Chat with Traders.